Good morning everyone. Welcome back to our YouTube channel SSLC Connect. My name is Amrita and in today's session I will be teaching you biology. In the previous two videos we finished and covered the concept of circulatory system and respiratory system in human beings. In today's session I will be covering transportation in plants along with how excretion works in human beings. Alright. So let's start. I hope you guys have a pen and a book and we can learn together. Alright, so transportation in plants. So in plants there are certain tissues known as conducting tissues. Alright, so there are two main terminologies that you have to familiarize with. So you have the xylem, okay, then you have a phloem. Alright, now what is a xylem? The xylem is responsible for the transportation of water along with certain minerals. Alright, so it moves water and minerals. And where are these water and minerals obtained from? It's obtained from the soil. And what is responsible for absorbing minerals and water from soil? They are the roots. Alright. Then we have the phloem. What do you think the phloem is going to be responsible for? We already took up minerals. We already took up water. What else is left? It's the food substance substances. Right. So the food substances are transported by the phloem. Now when I say uh, food substances, which process will provide food for the plants? It's going to be photosynthesis, right? I hope you guys know the terminology. Photo means light, synthesis means to make something. So in the presence of light, food is being produced in plants, alright? So now the conducting tissues, I told you xylem and phloem, right? Now the xylem and the phloem, together they are known as vascular bundles. Alright, now usually the arrangement of xylem and phloem is slightly different. Alright, now let's say this is a cross section of a stem. The xylem is usually towards the center and the phloem is towards the exterior. So let's say this would be your phloem. Alright, and this, the center region, this would be our xylem. Okay, so you have the xylem which is internally located and the phloem which lies outside of the tissue. Alright, together xylem and phloem, what are they known as? They are known as vascular bundles. Okay. So now we look into the different components or the elements of the xylem vessel. Okay, so you have four major components. You have the tracheids, vessels, fibers and the xylem parenchyma. So you will mainly have to remember tracheids and vessels. They are the major elements that help in the conducting uh, process of your uh, water and your minerals. Now your fibers basically, fibers here are basically your dead sclerenchyma cells. Okay, And dead sclerenchyma cells basically help in uh, mechanical support. Your parenchyma, anywhere, everywhere, Every time you see the word parenchyma, it basically means it helps in storage. So all your food molecules and other metabolites get stored in the parenchyma tissue. Okay, so we'll do a quick recall of what we just learned. There are four main elements of xylem tissue. You have the tracheids, vessels, fibers and parenchyma. Right, so tracheids and vessels are the ones responsible for the major conducting function. Your fibers, what kind of cells are fibers made up of? They are made up of sclerenchyma cells. What is the spelling? S-C-L-E-R-E-N-C-H-Y-M-A. Sclerenchyma cells. What kind of cells are they? They are basically nothing but dead cells. They do not have life in them. All right. If at all you have trouble remembering what are sclerenchyma cells, remember they say skeleton Right, you can see skeleton of like dead people, right? So skeleton, sclerenchyma, so you can think of it like that and remember, alright? And the final element of xylem is your parenchyma. Parenchyma is responsible for the storage of uh, food substances and other metabolites. Okay. So now we will get into the depth of how exactly is xylem doing the conducting function. Okay, We will get into the mechanism which is very important. So in xylem there are two ways that water is being conducted throughout the system of the plant. One is because of ion concentration and the second one is because of a certain phenomenon known as transpiration. 
So first we look into how the ion concentration gradient helps in the uptake of water. So if you look at let us say this is your plant, you have a root, okay. Okay, this is just the bottom section of the plant, these are the roots. In the soil, you have certain ions, right? Now, within the roots also, there are certain ions present, right? Now, in the plant system, the concentration of ions within the root is a lot more higher compared to the concentration of ions in the soil. So, this is nothing but our soil and these are my roots. Okay, these dot dot structures are basically a representation of ions. Now, in roots, roots have a particular way of absorbing ions from the surrounding. There are two types of transport systems, okay. One is known as the active transport method and the other is known as passive transmo transport method. Now, roots actively take up the ions. Now, when I say active, it basically means that it involves energy, alright. Now, in plants, the energy utilized is in the form of a high energy molecule known as ATP. It stands for adenosine triphosphate, okay. Whereas, passive transport or passive uptake of nutrients deals with the movement of your substances without the energy component, alright. So like I told you, ions, how are they taken up? They are taken during active transport where energy which is ATP is utilized. Now let us say and the reason why you need energy in active transport is because the movement of ions is moving from a lower concentration area to a higher concentration area. I am sure previously in your lower classes you have learned how usually products or substances always move from a higher concentration area to a lower concentration area. But in this case it is slightly different, right? It is moving from a lower concentration area to higher concentration area. That is why we need the ATP in this process, alright. So, now ions are moving in via active transport. Now, because of that, there it leads to a certain ion concentration gradient, alright. Now, because of this gradient, to eliminate this gradient, the water molecules, now let us say there are small water molecules also in the soil, okay. Now, these water molecules will also enter the root hair of the roots in order to eliminate the ion concentration gradient, alright. So finally, you have the water which is moving into the roots. Quick recall, so what is going to happen? You have ions in the soil, you have ions in the root hair of the root system. The ion concentration in the soil is less compared to the concentration inside. So via active transport, that is the use of ATP, ions will move from the soil and into the root hair. Now, because of this, there is a certain ion concentration gradient which is formed. Now, to eliminate that ion concentration, water will also be like, okay, I also will come in and I will stabilize the difference. So, water will slowly enter the root hairs, okay. Finally, the uh, root has been able to uptake or absorb water from the soil. Okay, and now you have the, I told you, you, we have the xylem vessels which are all connected from the roots, the stems and the leaves. So, the xylem will conduct the absorbed water to all the parts of the plant system. So, now that we are done with the first mechanism which involves the ion concentration, we will look into another phenomenon known as transpiration. Okay, now what is transpiration? Right? You know how let us say you go for a basketball match or you have a running race and you come back, you are done with the match or you are done with the race. You see that you are sweating, right? There is water all over your body along with certain salt which is being released from your body. Now similarly, that is nothing but sweating in our body. So plants also have a similar mechanism where they also tend to lose water from their entire system. That loss of water from plants is known as transpiration, okay. Now, 
how does transpiration help in absorption of water and the conduction of water let's say so transpiration mainly occurs from the leaf surfaces all right so you have the aerial parts of the plant let's say these are my leaves okay now i have absorbed water and let's say the plant is getting hot so my leaves are going to start evaporating the water from its surfaces all right through transpiration now because of the loss of water from my leaves okay there is a certain suction force there is a certain pressure exerted onto the entire plant system which will cause the roots to absorb more water to pull in more water into the system all right so finally you have your water and the dissolved minerals which will be sucked into the roots and then move through the entire xylem tissue throughout the entire plant system due to the phenomenon of transpiration all right so now that we finished the mechanism of how xylem utilize transpiration and ion concentration for absorption of water we will have to now understand transpiration in depth all right so what does transpiration what is it again it's nothing but the loss of water from the aerial parts of the plant so as you can look at this diagram for you to understand let's visually understand how exactly it's happening okay so you have water molecules that are being absorbed by the root hairs of the root they will enter the entire ion or the sorry the xylem vessel channel and they will move into the different parts of the plant and finally once water gets accumulated in the leaf structures and because of the presence of sunlight like how we sweat the plant will also be like okay i have to lose my water molecules and water molecules will start escaping from the leaf surface right through the process of transpiration now how do you think water molecules move out though like you remember if you look at our skin we can see tiny pores in our skin through which we sweat so our leaves also have tiny dot like structures if we look at the lower surface of the leaf they have tiny dot like structures known as the stomata stomata what are they they are nothing but tiny pores usually present on the lower surface of the leaves through which your water molecules are lost okay even during photosynthesis you require oxygen and carbon dioxide which is being exchanged right carbon dioxide is basically utilized by plants and they give out oxygen so that exchange of gases also occurs through the stomata and the stomata you need to remember when is it open and when is it closed the stomata is usually closed during the night and open during the day so transpiration also the majority of transpiration occurs during the day time because that's when the stomata is open and because of the stomata only the water molecules are escaping okay now we'll go into the second importance removal of excess water so you know the roots are absorbing water they are transporting the water to the different parts now if the water just keeps getting accumulated into the plant system don't you think the cells will start rupturing it's like overeating let's say you're eating a lot of food your stomach is becoming bigger 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 and if you don't stop or if you don't let it digest then it's going to hurt your internal organs so similarly transpiration also when water is being pulled into the plant system the plant also has to remove the water so it will take enough water whatever is required it will utilize and it will store but if at all there is little bit extra that the plant doesn't need the plant will be like you have to leave my body now i cannot accommodate you there is no space for you so transpiration will be like okay don't worry i will take care of you i will remove this excess water so you don't have to feel the burden of trying to store me okay now we'll get into the third effect that is known as the cooling effect like i told you you finished playing a basketball match and you're sweating when you're running okay so basically all these sport activities require a lot of physical exertion so because of that the temperature within your body will also start increasing correct so plants are also exposed to sunlight they will also slowly build up a certain heat energy within their body now in order to regulate that heat they will transpire like how we sweat to regulate our temperature plants will also undergo transpiration for removal of water 
okay so when water is being removed from your body it's also carrying a certain amount of your body heat that's why it's causing the entire cooling effect okay now we will get into the fourth um, importance that is nothing but the absorption and distribution so we know transpiration is occurring water is going in and this water will also help in the equal distribution of all the minerals and the salts throughout the entire plant system okay so now we finish understanding the first conductive tissue which is nothing but xylem responsible for water and mineral distribution now we will look into phloem okay the transport of food is conducted by your phloem tissue so right now we will look into we know that plants they conduct photosynthesis in which products such as your glucose and carbon dioxide is released now this glucose molecules what is the why do we require food why do you eat food obviously probably because you like the taste of food it it satisfies your soul right but at the same time we also require food for energy without energy our cells won't be able to survive so plants also will have to create the food and distribute the the food to all parts of the plant like see we know photosynthesis occurs in the leaves but the food cannot just stay in the leaves no even the roots require it the stems also require the food for energy because the entire plant is made up of million of cells and every cell requires energy now how is plants going to conduct the food from the leaves they are going to use your phloem tissue all right the phloem tissue so now we look into the elements or the components of the phloem tissue you have the sieve tube okay you have the sieve tube s i e v e tube sieve tubes along with sieve tubes we also have another cell known as the companion cell c u m p a n i o n cell okay so you have your sieve tubes and your companion cells which make up the entire phloem tissue now the ma the major component which helps in the conduction of food is going to be your sieve tubes so can you see this entire structure here this is your sieve tube okay so it's through the sieve tubes that your food particles are going to be conducted whereas your companion cells the word companion the word companion means a friend someone who helps you do a uh, certain task or helps you uh, with your homework all right so your companion cells will here also what do they do they assist the sieve tubes in order to help for the conduction of food materials okay so it doesn't have a major role in terms of conduction of the material it just assists and make sure that the sieve tube does its function properly which is nothing but the transport of food substances throughout the entire plant system all right and one more thing you need to know is let's say this is your xylem tissue okay you have the water molecules which are moving in only one direction from the roots towards the aerial parts of the plant whereas in phloem the phloem tissues will basically have the movement of particles in both direction upward and the downward direction okay because phloem is nothing but conduction of food substances and where are these food substances coming from they are coming from the leaves of the plants now there are different leaves at different positions of the plant right let me just draw a quick plant this is your root okay you have leaves at different positions correct okay so and we know that food is required for every single cell of the plant so the food substances which is created or produced in the leaves will basically move like this this will all the food substance from here will move here okay it move into the plants then uh, the root sorry then the substances from this leaf will also move in the upper direction so basically the food particles are moving in all directions it's a bidirectional process whereas xylem is moving in only one direction 
okay now we will understand how exactly it's happening like visually we will try to understand how your companion cells and your sieve tubes are helping in the conduction of your food substances so this is nothing but your leaf cell okay so this is one small cell within the entire leaf every cell is is undergoing photosynthesis and producing your glucose and uh, food substances right now let's say the food substances will move slowly into the companion cell all right so this is your leaf cell the food substances will move into the companion cell first then the companion cell will give away the food substance into the sieve tube okay and the sieve tube will which has now received all the food particles will start conducting the uh, food material so the food material will either go upwards or it will start moving downwards towards the root system okay now in the root system let's say it has reached the bottom of the plant where that's where the roots are situated now the food substances from the sieve tube will move into the companion cell and the companion cell will pass it on to the roots so basically what's happening now the entire food which is being created in the leaves are being conducted throughout the entire system of the plant towards the upper regions and towards the lower regions okay now can you see this tube here beside the phloem this is your xylem tissue i told you know xylem it's a unidirectional movement of the particles right the food molecules will move only in one direction that is from the roots where is it going from from the roots to the leaves or stems so the leaves or stems can be considered to be the aerial parts of the plants aerial plants are nothing but your stem plus your leaves okay so xylem water is moving from the roots either by a transpiration or the ion concentration gradient that we studied in the beginning and it is moving upwards okay whereas phloem it's going in two directions from the leaves to the roots from the roots to the leaves from leaves to other leaves from the leaves to other stems throughout the entire system okay so now we looked into food being transported because of phloem tissue now this entire process okay of food being conducted throughout the phloem tissue is known as translocation okay translocation is nothing but a process in which the food substances which is produced in the leaves are moving through the phloem throughout the entire plant system so can we read the definition together it is the transport of food from the leaves to the other parts of the plants and it occurs in the part of the vascular tissue which is nothing but your phloem so it's nothing but the conduction of food materials throughout the plant system due to the presence of phloem tissue now we'll do a quick recall into the entire mechanism what are the two conducting tissues you have xylem and phloem what are the elements of xylem you have xylem tracheids vessels fibers and parenchyma it's your xylem vessels and tracheids which are responsible for the major transportation system okay of water and minerals whereas phloem what are the two components of phloem it's going to be your sieve tubes and your companion cells and they phloem helps in the conduction of food materials and other metabolites now we just visually try to recall the entire mechanism let's start with xylem which is for the conduction of water so we look into the conduction of water through the xylem vessel okay so i told you two mechanism either via ion concentration gradient or because of transpirational pull okay so now e through either one of these mechanisms water will enter the root hair enter the root system and it will move through the entire channel of the xylem vessel okay can you see this conduction in one direction only okay it's not going downwards only upwards all right that is the conduction of water due to the presence of xylem tissues now what about phloem okay so this is the leaf leaf will conduct the process of photosynthesis in which your food substances are being made or produced now the food substances made here will slowly move into the let's say you have a companion cell here 
Okay, I'm just going to write C for companion cell and then you have your sieve tube, ST I'm going to write, okay, sieve tube. So the food molecules will enter the companion cell first and then from the companion cell into the sieve tube and from the sieve tube it will start moving towards the entire system of the plant, okay. okay. So now that we are done with the entire transportation in plants, we finish xylem and we finish phloem. Now we are going to jump into the humans, okay. We are going to talk about you and I and we are going to talk about excretion process, right. And we are going to talk about the entire excretory system and the importance of the excretory organs in our body, right. Now excretion occurs in all uh, living organisms. It happens in plants, it happens in human beings, it happens in uh, tiny, tiny unicellular molecule, I mean uh, organisms such as your bacteria and certain fungi also. Every living organism will have to undergo excretion process. Now what do you mean by the term excretion? Something to do with removal, right? So, why do we remove things from a body? Because we don't require it. If there are certain substances which a body does not have to uh, use, the body does not have to spend extra energy to store it, right? So, the body will have to come up with ways to let go of those harmful substances. So, excretion can be defined as the elimination or the removal of harmful metabolic substances from the body of the organism. Okay. Now, human beings, we have a proper organ, we have an entire system which is responsible solely for excretion and that organ is nothing but your kidney. Okay. So, how we have our kidneys to remove waste or uh, substances? Your unicellular organisms such as uh, bacteria, I told you they lose their uh, or remove the substances from their body surface, okay. Now, how do they remove their uh, substances, harmful substances from their body surface is due to a process known as diffusion, okay. It is nothing but the so, it basically the substances are diffusing from the skin or the surface of their body, okay. So, kidneys we have in the human body which help in excretion, let us say certain unicellular organisms, how do they lose their uh, waste substances through their body surface via the process known as diffusion, okay, simple diffusion. So, through the body surface the uh, waste substances will just slowly move out. So now we look into the entire excretory system, okay, the different components of the system which enables us to uh, do excretion process properly. Now we have the kidneys, I told you, can you see these two bean shaped structures here? These are your kidneys, okay, you have a pair of kidneys. Then you have a tube that is coming out of the kidney, I am going to separately draw it for your reference. So the kidney is done. There is a tube like structure coming out of the kidney. This is nothing but your ureter, okay. Then the ureter opens into a sac like structure known as the urinary bladder, okay. Then there is an opening in the urinary bladder which is known as the urethra, okay. Please do not get the spellings confused, U R E T H. R A urethra. This is your ureter. Okay. Even in school, I also used to get confused between ureter and urethra. Remember, ureter is the tube that's coming out of the kidney and connecting it into the urinary bladder. The urethra. Okay. The urethra is nothing but the opening of the gallbladder. Okay the urinary bladder out of which the urine is going to be excreted out. Now we will go into the function and the integral structure of the different components of the entire excretory system, okay. So now we will look into kidneys, right, the major organ for excretion. So what is the structure of kidney? Ha have you guys eaten rajma chawal? It is one of my favorite foods. Have you seen rajma? It looks like a kidney, you know, it has a kidney shaped structure 
And if you also look at the color of the rajma, it's usually reddish brown in color. Even your kidney, the organ is also bean shaped like your rajma and it's also reddish brown in color as you can see in the diagram. Okay, so it's bean shaped in structure and it is reddish brown in terms of its color. And where is it located? The kidney is located in your abdom abdominal cavity. Okay, the abdomen basically right on either side of your backbone. Then you have in terms of the end, uh, the location, the exact location of the kidney based on how it is placed. If you see, if you take, if you look at a proper diagram, the entire system of the human body, you will notice that the left kidney, okay, the left kidney is slightly higher than the right kidney, okay. Let's say this is your, uh, Okay, you have a kidney, this is your vertebral column, you have one kidney here, let us say this is my left kidney and this is my right kidney. The left kidney is slightly higher than the right kidney. Okay, now the reason why it is this way is because we have the liver organ, right? The liver organ is also placed right below the left kidney. That is why your body has adapted and uh, situated different organs in a way that they can accommodate other organs. Remember your liver is said to be the largest organ in your body. So, in order to accommodate the liver in your system, the left kidney is slightly above the uh, right kidney in terms of its exact position. Now, we will look into uh, the different arteries in the system. Okay, there are two types of arteries. Can you see the diagram? There is a red color vein coming here. Okay, that is known as your renal artery r e n a l artery a r t e r y okay renal artery the red color tube here is your renal artery so what is the renal artery do it basically collects all the impure blood okay and brings it to the kidney for, for purification then can you see the blue color uh, pipe kind of thing here so that is nothing but your renal vein okay the so, renal vein after the kidney does its purification and excretion process the purified blood will move into the renal vein and the renal vein will carry the purified blood towards the rest of your body okay so i'm just going to quickly recall this the kidney it's bean shaped in structure, it is reddish brown in color. If you look at its uh, location, it's located near the abdom abdomen and the left kidney is slightly above or placed higher than the right kidney and there are two major uh, pipes or ducts next to the uh, kidney. You have the renal artery and the renal vein. The renal artery will basically bring in the impure blood for purification and the renal vein will carry the purified blood towards the rest of your body. Now that we are done with the kidney, we will look into the duct that basically connects the kidney to the sac like structure below which is the urinary bladder. So the ureter is nothing but a small duct which is connecting the kidney to the urinary bladder. Okay, I have not drawn the other, I will draw the other kidney also for your reference so that you do not get confused. Okay, so you have the kidney, then you have the two ducts connecting the kidney to the urinary bladder with this is known, known as your ureter, not urethra, it is ureter. Okay. Now what do the ureters do? What is the function of the ureter? They basically help in draining out the urine. So the kidney will purify the blood, it will remove all the waste products and now the urine that is formed will have to be removed. No, So it will pass through the ureter. So the ureter is basically acting as a pipe to collect the urine and bring it to the urinary bladder. And once it there is pressure that is building in the urinary bladder, then it will flow out through uh, out of the urethra okay now we will get into the second second section where we'll talk about um, urinary bladder what is urinary bladder it's nothing but a pear shaped structure so i have to draw it i will draw it like this 
okay so it's a pear shaped structure so the ureter will bring in the urine and the urine will get collected in the gall bladder okay so the urinary bladder what it does it basically stores the urine for a certain amount of time and once there is pressure that builds in the um urinary bladder it will cause it will basically open the urethra and the urine will flow out okay okay now we'll talk about the urethra a quick revision so we have the urinary bladder right then you have the urethra the opening of the bladder right you need to remember that there are two there are these two muscles known as the sphincter muscles okay they are present near the gall bladder all right so they are nothing but sphincter muscles s p i n c h t e r sphincter muscles now once the urine gets accumulated in the urinary bladder there is a certain pressure exerted i told you right now when there is pressure exerted the sphincter muscles will relax okay when they relax this urethra this is nothing but your urethra what is the urethra what happens to the urethra when the sphincter muscle relaxes the urethra opens up so when it opens the urine will basically pass out what is coming out it is a yellowish fluid known as the urine all right so if you can look at this diagram you have quick recall you have the kidney from the kidney you have two tubes coming which is known as the ureter then you have the urinary bladder and the opening of the urinary bladder which is known as the urethra so now the function of kidney we already know it's the excretory organ so it's going to take in the impure blood it's going to purify it let go of the pure blood and whatever uh, harmful substances that are removed uh, in the form of urine will be excreted out of the system okay if you look into this diagram this is your kidney this vein coming here is your renal vein this is your renal artery so it's the artery that carries the impure blood that has to be purified so the impure blood enters the kidney the kidney does all filtration absorption processes and finally whatever harmful substances are removed that will pass on to your ureter this is the ureter what is going into the ureter it is your urine okay urine will pass into the ureter then whatever blood is being purified will go back into the renal vein towards the rest of your body so if they ask you in the exam what is the function of the kidney main function is to remove poisonous substances right such as urea uric acid also in the form of a yellowish liquid known as urine okay now what what is the other function apart from just removing these harmful substances because it's removing a lot of minerals and other uh, let's say you're taking any antibiotics your antibiotics also once it does its function it will also have to be removed from your body now when it's removing these uh, minerals and other uh, metabolites from your body it also regulates the osmotic pressure or the water balance of your blood in your blood so majority of your blood consists of water okay now in your kidney there is a lot of reabsorption of water like your blood has water your kidney will take a lot of water back into your system it doesn't want to remove too much water okay it will remove a certain amount of water along with harmful substances and pass it on in the form of urine okay now so as it's removing certain amount of water and it's removing certain minerals right it will regulate the water balance or the osmotic pressure within the blood okay then it regulates the ph the ph is nothing but the the ph of any substance will determine the acidity or the alkalinity if you look at the ph of the blood it's usually around the range of 7.4 ph of 7.4 so slightly towards the alkaline side of the ph scale all right now we will get into the details of how exactly the entire kidney is functioning okay so we have the kidney it is the organ but within the entire kidney is going to draw a small kidney here let's say okay there are tiny filtering units 
there are millions of these tiny filtering units throughout the entire kidney okay it's all over the entire kidney organ okay so these filtering units are known as your nephrons nephrons the other terminology for nephrons is your uriniferous tubules uriniferous tubules okay so what are nephrons they are nothing but your filtration units okay in the kidney they are the ones responsible for removing the harmful substances and also reabsorbing certain important molecules which are required by the body and a lot of water which is also reabsorbed okay so in the nephron if you look at the nephron structure it has two distinct regions okay very important you have the malpighian capsule and the renal tubule okay i will show you a structure in the next slide so you just have to remember there are two distinct regions in the nephron the malpighian capsule and the renal tubule now the malpighian capsule is again made up of two different uh, structures okay so you have the baumann's capsule all right along with another structure known as the glomerulus okay so basically the baumann's capsule along with the glomerulus together forms a structure known as the malpighian capsule now what does your glomerulus do the glomerulus is very its function is basically to filter the blood into the baumann's capsule okay so i'm just going to draw the structure here okay the cup shaped structure here is your baumann's capsule inside the baumann's capsule you have your glomerulus okay so i'm going to label it now glomerulus and this is your baumann's capsule all right so the glomerulus so here basically you have a uh, two arterioles okay we'll get into the structures a little bit later so the glomerulus will it will receive the impure blood okay once the impure blood goes in the glomerulus will basically absorb all the uh, nutrients whatever nutrients is required it will absorb those nutrients a certain amount of the um, liquid part the liquid part of the blood will be absorbed by the glomerulus and that absorbed content will be moved into the baumann's capsule okay so here the liquid that moves from the glomerulus into the baumann's capsule is said to be the glomerular filtrate what is it known as the glomer ruler fill trait not urine urine hasn't been formed here the whatever fluid is being absorbed by the glomerulus is known as the glomerular filtrate and where does this glomerular filtrate go it moves into the baumann's capsule okay now we we finish we understood the function of uh, glomerulus and the baumann's capsule the baumann's capsule is basically just receiving the uh, the uh, glomerular filtrate now we have the second distinct region of the uh, nephron it's known as the renal tubule okay the renal tubule of the nephron there are different uh, components of the renal tubule also one section is known as the pct pct stands for proximal convo convoluted tubule okay you have the pct which stands for proximal convoluted tubule then we have another section known as the dct the dct is nothing but the sorry the distal convoluted what is it what does t stand for for tubule 
okay so pct and dct pct proximal convoluted tubule and dct which is distal convoluted tubule the other section of your renal tubule is your uh, we have something known as the loop of henle loop of henle h e n l e okay it's basically a structure like this we will i will show you we have a beautiful diagram explaining the different structures i'm just briefing you about it right now okay loop of henle then up, uh, after loop of henle there's another structure known as the collecting duct collecting duct okay so quick recall into the different components of renal tubule we have something known as the pct the dct the loop of henle i'm just going to write l o h loop of henle and the collecting duct okay the collecting duct so th there are four major components that make up the renal tubule pct dct loop of henle and the collecting ducts and what comes under the malpighian to a capsule it is your glomerulus and the baumens capsule together makes up the malpighian capsule yeah. now now we look into the structure okay we study the different sections now we need to visually understand where exactly the malpighian capsule is where is the renal tubule where is the pct dct loop of henle and the collecting ducts so this entire structure that you can see right now is nothing but the nephron structure okay now like i told you the first section the first region is the malpighian capsule what is it made up of the glomerulus and the baumens capsule okay so can you see this coil of capillaries it's nothing but your glomerulus okay glomerulus is nothing but it is basically um, a a bunch of capillaries together intertwined capillaries make up the glomerulus okay the glomerulus then the glomerulus where is it placed within its place within the baumens capsule okay so you have the uh, impure blood that enters through a certain arteriole known as the efferent arteriole the efferent arteriole is through which the impure blood is entering okay then you have another outgoing arteriole known as the efferent arteriole okay the ingoing arteriole is efferent remember a comes before e so efferent is the ingoing arteriole then the efferent arteriole is the whatever blood that is been absorbed whatever remaining blood is there that will pass out through the efferent arteriole okay so glomerulus what what is the function it will basically filter out the blood okay it will remove a certain amount of water and uh, minerals along with it okay and that fluid that is collected by the glomerulus is known as the glomerul glomerular filtrate now that is the filtrate that enters the baumens capsule and further enters the renal tubule so from this section this section this section onwards this entire thing makes up the renal tubule okay only the glomerulus and the baumens capsule is the malpighian capsule after this starts your entire renal tubule what are the components of renal tubule we did its distal tubule the dct the pct then we have the uh, loop of henle okay this entire loop here is the loop of henle and you have the collecting ducts all right now uh, the functions of proximal tubule and dct what they do is majority of the reabsorption of your important chemical uh, not chemicals more like ions okay and certain salts along with water occurs in the pct and dct all you need to remember is pct and dct major function is reabsorption okay so certain uh, majority of the water is absorbed in the pct okay then certain chloride ions will be absorbed in dct along with a certain amount of water again then the loop of henle will also absorb a certain amount of water along with certain important molecules which are required by your body such as your amino acids 
okay the body doesn't want to let go of amino uh, of amino acids all right along with certain uh, proteins okay so certain substances such as proteins amino acids will have to be reabsorbed by a body okay that occurs in the loop of henle along with certain glucose molecules are also reabsorbed then whatever um, remaining unwanted substances are there they will pass into the collecting duct okay once it reaches the collecting duct you have the urine okay so the fluid that reaches the collecting duct that goes out of the collecting duct is known as the urine okay so this is just a little more complex diagram of the nephron is the same thing you have the this is your efferent this thing is your efferent arteriole i'm going to write a t a sorry a a afferent arteriole the one that goes out is the efferent arteriole we have the glomerulus inside you have the bowman's capsule you have the pct the loop of henle the dct and the collecting duct okay it's the collecting duct that opens up into the ureter so the collecting duct basically connects to the ureter then from the ureter to the urinary bladder and from the urinary bladder to the urethra and the urine passes out of the body now that we finish understanding the structure of the nephron and the different functions of the different components of the nephron we need to understand the different stages in the formation of urine or the production of urine so there are three main stages that you need to know one is the filtration okay remember i told you the glomerulus and the bowman's capsule making up the malpighian capsule they are the ones that do the filtration process okay so the clus the capillary cluster is nothing but your glomerulus associated with the cup shaped end that is nothing but your bowman's capsule what do, what do they do they will collect the filtered urine okay what the pure, uh, whatever uh, substances and water that is uh, removed from the blood and which is filtered from the blood will enter into the bowman's capsule okay that is the first stage of urine formation which is known as filtration it occurs in the malpighian capsule only now the second step which is known as reabsorption okay now this reabsorption in you will have to know there's a it's not just absorbing everything it's not absorbing every single material it is very selective so the process it will be more accurate for you to also utilize the terminology known as selective reabsorption okay reabsorption is what is happening but the method of reabsorption is selective in nature that means only certain substances are removed and certain substances are retained by the body okay now where does reabsorption occur it occurs in the renal tubule i'm going to write it down again i'll write it here it occurs in the renal tubule that is the second distinct region of the nephron structure reabsorption occurs in the renal tubule filtration occurs in the uh, malpighian capsule malpighian capsule has your glomerulus and your bowman's capsule okay first two stages are done now we have the final stage which is nothing but the excretion part okay so you have the third stage which is nothing but excretion that is nothing but the final removal of the urine from the urethra okay so the urine which gets stored in the urinary bladder under once it reaches a certain amount of pressure it will expand and it will pass out through the urethra okay so there are three major steps in the formation of urine one is the first stage is filtration that occurs in the uh, malpighian capsule after that there is reabsorption where certain uh, important salts and uh, certain molecules like your proteins and amino acids right amino acids glucose molecules your certain salts and a lot of water is reabsorbed selectively in your renal tubule okay that is your pct dct loop of henle and collecting ducts then finally the last stage is your excretion process where the urine that comes from the collecting duct into the 
uh, uh, ure ureter and then into the gall bladder or the urinary bladder and then it finally there is a certain amount of pressure that builds in the bladder and finally it comes out of the urethra ok the urethra. Now that we studied the entire structure of kidney we understood the filtering units of kidneys are known as nephrons which is responsible for the filtration reabsorption and excretion process for finally producing urine and removing all these nitrogenous and harmful waste substances from your body. Now let us say sometimes you know your body tends to become weak and your organs start failing that time your you will have to come up with technology in order to replace your natural organs right. So, there is something known as the artificial kidney ok. So, the artificial kidney is something that humans came up with it is basically a device ok. It is a device which does the exact same function of your kidney ok. It has it executes the same function of your nephrons right where it does the filtration process, it does reabsorption process and it does the excretion process. So, the artificial kidney how do they utilize the artificial kidney there is a, there is a process known as dialysis ok. Dialysis is basically a process in which they utilize the artificial kidney in order to do the filtration process and remove all the harmful substances in order to efficiently uh, replace the original kidney ok. So, it is a procedure used in artificial kidney to replace a non functional or a damaged kidney alright. Now, in this process what happens in dialysis? Now, let us they will be two veins ok, they will take two veins and they will be two tubes. Now, one tube you will have your impure blood which is coming out and that tube is connected to this dialysis, uh, dialysis machine this entire machine here is known as the dia dialysis machine. So, let us say this is my hand ok, I have two tubes coming out of they are connected two tubes. One tube is connected to the machine where my impure blood is going inside the machine and the machine is going to purify the blood ok. Now, there is some within the machine there is something known as the dialyzing solution, dialyzing solution. So, there is a tiny tank ok which will contain your dialyzing solution. Now, the dialyzing solution is will basically do the exact function of your nephron. So, what do they do? All the harmful substances which are not required by a body will slowly start diffusing into this liquid. So, you have your impure blood which is coming in ok wait I will just draw it on this side ok. So, this is my hand ok, I have a tube connected to this machine. Now, my impure blood is going to flow into this machine, it will enter the dialyzing solution. Once it enters the dialyzing solution all the uh, let us say chloride ions all different ions salts and other uh, molecules which are not required by a, by your body the harmful substances which are not required by your body will slowly start diffusing into the dialyzing solution. So, basically the dialyzing solution is acting as an agent in order to absorb all the harmful substances ok. Now, finally all the harmful substances that are absorbed by the dialyzing solution will move into a separate tank ok. These are all your harmful substances ok. Uh, all your harmful substances will get accumulated in this in one tank. Now, whatever the rest of the blood you have remaining blood the blood is still there right. Now, you have another tube which is coming out of the device which will carry your purified blood. So, the purified blood will move into the patient's hand again. So, you have two tubes I am going to do this again. So, you have 
two tubes that are connected okay one tube will carry your impure blood and it will move that impure blood is moving into the tank okay into the tank that contains which solution the dialyzing solution what does the dialyzing solution do they will ensure that they remove all the harmful substances from the blood they are basically purifying the blood so once the all those harmful substances are absorbed all that uh, harmful substances and uh, uh, substances which are not required by the body will move into a separate tank which is discarded okay and the purified blood once the blood is purified that blood will come back from the uh, machine and it will be connected back in the second tube it will flow back into the human body so you have the impure blood coming out the dialyzing machine is doing the function of the kidney and the purified blood is going to come back into our system so the first tube that is carrying the impure blood is acting as the efferent arteriole we rem remember we did this the efferent arteriole and the other tube that is coming from the machine and connecting to our body is the will will act as the efferent arteriole sorry okay so you have your uh, one tube that's acting as the efferent arteriole which is carrying your impure blood and the other tube connected will act as the efferent arteriole which will take back the purified blood the whatever blood is remaining okay whatever after removing all the harmful substances uh, the blood is going to go back into the second tube so this is this is not there this is not there in this uh, dialysis machine i'm just trying to explain how it is connected how in your real kidney we have the efferent and uh, afferent arteriole similarly we have those two ducts that the nurse will come and they'll connect to um, tubes to the dialysing machine that will act as these two arterioles is what i'm trying to say don't get confused okay so yeah that's about it so what what does dialysis do they basically the, it, it's a, it's a procedure adapted in order to uh, execute the same function of your kidneys all right where your blood is purified through the three stages filtration reabsorption and excretion where the uh, harmful substances are removed in the form of a yellowish fluid known as the urine okay so the process where you are utilizing the artificial kidney is known as dialysis okay now what is dialysis nothing but it's a process in which you you have a device okay you have a device can you see this machine here this is known as the dialysis machine okay it's going to do the same function as that of your natural kidney organ now within this machine there is a small tank okay in this tank there is a certain solution known as the dialyzing solution okay now what is the dialyzing solution do it will basically act as an absorbent of all the chemical uh, uh, substances and all the harmful nitrogenous waste substances right so now the patient that is lying down she will have her arm to her arm they will have two tubes that are connected okay one tube both the tubes are connected to the machine through one tube the impure blood that has to be purified within the human body will enter the machine and then it will enter the tank that contains the dialyzing solution okay now the impure blood will be will enter this dialyzing solution and it is being purified all the harmful substances are removed once it is removed all the uh, harmful substances will move into another tank okay and then the then you also you still have your purified blood right the purified blood will also will move back into the patient i'm just going to draw the patient's hand like this okay and they will connect it through a tube okay so let's say you have a purified blood is coming out okay this is the hand of the patient and it is connected to a tube here okay and it's going to enter the vein of the patient so you have one tube that is coming 
into the dialysing machine impure blood is going in purifying the blood then the uh, all the impure substances will move into another tank and the remaining purified blood that is there it has to come back to the body right obviously then the purified blood will enter the second tube and it will go back into the human body okay so that's what's happening throughout the entire process so there is the blood of the patient is allowed to pass through a long tube okay which is dipped in a tank containing the dialysing solution in the dialysing solution there is removal of the harmful substances then the uh, the waste substances will diffuse out from the blood into the tank like i told you then finally the the clean blood it has to go back into the patient obviously so the clean blood will finally go back into the patient through the vein through the second tube it will enter the patient's blood stream and now the patient has purified blood as well okay and so so that's why they don't have to worry about a failed kidney because you have this technology has developed in a way that we have alternative methods to sustain life now we will understand how excretion process is occurring in plants okay so we studied about how we have the kidneys to uh, uh, to enable excretion process plants also have different methods in order to remove the waste products in their system so how so the first three points cover the entire process of how harmful substances are being removed from the plant body but in some cases plants don't really let go of those waste products they store these waste products okay now if you look into uh, have you seen rubber plantations people basically cut the stem of the or the bark of the uh, rubber tree and there's a white color liquid that comes out of the tree right so that liquid in the case of rubber is said to be latex it's called latex okay the white color fluid that comes out of the tree this latex is nothing but a waste product which is stored in the plant okay then there are other waste products such as your certain oils like essential oils that people use i'm sure on instagram you've seen some influencers be like you know you should use eucalyptus oil clove oil and things like that for your skin and things like that so we have certain oil substances uh, obtained from sandalwood trees from eucalyptus trees from certain spices such as clove okay and even lavender oil okay that people use all these are also waste products which are stored in the plant body then there are also other waste products such as resins and gums okay so resins and gums are also stored in certain vacuoles known as your cellular vacuoles in the plant let's say this is my plant this is one single plant cell plant cells have a lot of vacuoles right let's say this is one large vacuole present in the plant cell okay there's a large vacuole in the plant cell in this vacuole a lot of these waste products will get stored okay so products such as your resins and gums will also get stored in these large vacuoles within the plant cell all right so quick recall plants they let go of certain substances in their body some of them they will retain the substances that they let go into the environment are your gaseous waste products that's your carbon dioxide and oxygen along with it there's also water vapor that is lost through the process of transpiration in some cases they store the waste products such as your resins and gums which is stored in certain cellular vacuoles within the plant cell and there are uh, other um, substances such as your sandalwood oil clove oil your latex that i told you about the latex found in a uh, rubber is also uh, stored within the plant system so we have two pictures here for you to just like understand how exactly it's happening so let's say transpiration is happening and these are this is nothing but the stem so on the stem what are the tiny pores on the stem known as known as lenticles i'm going to write it here lenticles they are the tiny pores found on the stem okay the tiny pore 
found on the leaves are known as stomata. Okay, so these are your lenticles through which the water is basically coming out. Through through these holes, your um, oxygen and carbon dioxide will also be released into the environment. Now here you have the stomata. You have tiny pores on the leaf structure also. So here also you have your water which is being which is coming out due to the phenomenon of transpiration. And along with water, the water might also carry certain salts or minerals along with it. Okay, when it's carrying certain salts or minerals along with it, it those minerals will get deposited onto the surface of the leaf. So these are basically those small small salts which are coming out of the plant body which is not required by the plant. So this is also a way of excreting out those harmful or unwanted substances from the plant body. Now here as you can see there are uh, leaves falling down right. So sometimes the food, the, the waste products will get stored in leaves also. They will just get stored there and when the leaves fall down those waste products are also getting detached from the entire plant body. That is what is happening here. So this is just showing that if at all there are certain waste products stored in the leaves, those leaves will fall down and there is removal of the waste substances from the entire plant system and yeah that is about it. Alright, so like with that we have come to the end of the chapter life processes and uh, in the next class we will be covering control and coordination. Alright, so thank you so much for joining me in today's session. I hope you guys understood. If at all you have any doubts you can always go into the comment section and we will get back to you and we have really crisp notes on the SSLC connect app. So please do download the app and then have and then you will have access to the revision notes. Alright and then um, yeah I mean I am excited to see you guys in the next session and hopefully we get to learn more together and we grow together. Thank you.